Hello and welcome. This is the Singularity Syndicate podcast. I'm Naja Faisal. Karina Gardner joins me today. She's a fabric and paper designer, content creator, and an owner of Design Suite, where people can earn as they learn how to design. She has a PhD in design, and we'll explore AI's role and impact on the field of design. And now, here's Karina Gardner. So Karina, I want to start with AI's impact on design. On your YouTube channel, you and your friend compare AI-generated design versus um, designs produced through the, what we call traditional methods now. Uh, what were the key findings uh, of these experiments? You know, everybody who's in design has been afraid of AI, but we really proved that AI is actually very helpful to us as designers. Like it's a great place to start. Um, right now, the two that designers are really should be looking at are Mid Journey and Adobe Firefly. Those are the two we're like, we're kind of keeping an eye on to see what's going to happen. And the number one finding we found is that it's just not there yet. You know, I saw, um, I saw Alex Hermosi talking about uh, how you can now create, you know, all these logos with AI. You can say you want a Van Gogh logo, and then you can put that in, and it can make eight variations for you or 20 variations. The problem is that's a great idea, but in the practical world, it doesn't actually work. And the number one issue I'll tell you that I do think AI is going to fix in the future, and I hope it fixes, is that everything right now is pixel based. And pixel based basically means that it can only build and create at a certain size. So maybe it's creating something that's 12 by 12 at 300 DPI, so a high resolution, but that does not work for a logo. If you, I just, this recently happened. One of my friends is a gymnastics owner. She needed her logo blown up to put on the side of her building. So she needed something that was like 20 feet long, right? AI can't do that for you because it's pixel based. It's not creating big enough images to work. So the transition we need to see in AI is vector based products. So vector based, we can build and create as big as we want. Designers who are creating logos should be the good ones are making it in um, Illustrator software or any other kind of vector type software out there. So that's like the number one finding. Uh, every designer is so worried about their job. And I actually think we're going to need more designers because people are going to go into the AI software, get some great ideas and say, I want this. And now a designer has to be good enough to replicate it and fix it up so it can be usable and functional in the real world. Right. So I'm going to play the devil advocates a little bit here. Um, I'm going to try to argue with you. Uh, I've worked 15 years in advertising industry. So I've, I'm also familiar with Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and uh, InDesign and all of these tools. Um, and I, I totally get uh, the difference between vector-based and pixel-based. You know, as soon as you um, you stretch or you make any pixel-based image large, you can easily see that it's pixelated and uh, the quality immediately um, disappeared. Where if you have a vector-based, no matter how much you can stretch it, it still works perfectly. I would say that, uh, first of all, the use cases for uh, where we where you need to stretch an image or a logo for um, for like a sign uh, in a on a building, right? It's very niche, so the very few people need to really put a printed sign on their on their building, right? The most of our use cases for our logos and designs are either for social media content or for our website or anything that has to do with screens. And so far, I mean, you know, AI could generate these images and they look pretty good on the screen. So this is number one, like why do we need the, the vector, right? 
Yeah, I do. I do think it depends on who you hang out with. I hang out with a lot of brick and mortars. So all of them need signage. So there's that. The second thing is you never know when you actually do need to blow something up, right? That That is my biggest concern. Yes, we're mostly using it on screens, but pretend my company gets much bigger and I decide I want to start doing sponsorships in baseball fields. Well, suddenly... I've I'm not been I haven't been using a big blown up thing, but suddenly I do need one and I don't have one and I have to go pay a designer to go fix my pixel based one to make it work for something else. It's just it's kind of a backlog. The other thing is at the end of the day, we simply have a lot more control with vector based products than we do with Photoshop or pixel based products. We can control the color better. We get a cleaner line from it. Even on screen, we still get a better line. We do a, I have a couple of books on Amazon and we have like some daily planners on Amazon. And I was surprised Amazon, when they sent me the cover uh, photos, they weren't set up at 300 DPI, which is the typical printing resolution. They were actually set up at 600 DPI. And if I had created all of the surface pattern things in uh, Photoshop, I would not have been able to upload them to Amazon. But I had created them first in Illustrator. And because they were vector-based, I easily was able to transport it over at 600 DPI. It was no problem. So, I mean, the answer is yes, for the most part. If we're just using it online, we're okay. But I think there are enough interesting ways that we're thinking and using about our our design work that we have to be careful in thinking we can just get away with being pixel based. I would say that maybe it removes the barrier to entry. If if before the AI era, let's say you are a small business and you just want to get things started. Uh, you don't want to, you know, pay a designer five hundred dollars here to design you a logo and uh, three hundred dollars here to design you something else. I feel that, uh, you know, AI allows us an opportunity to get our MVP, our minimum viable product, have it look it look good, average presentable, get you going, get your business rolling. And then definitely, if uh, you know, if you got a sponsorship in baseball, then definitely it's uh, you need to hire a designer, and it would be a worth of investment. But now, instead of having to pay upfront, because a lot of the times when we hire designers, we're just trying to conceptualize a business, and this takes me to your entrepreneurial venture. I mean, I looked at your website, and there's definitely a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. The whole thing, I mean, I could see that your your website is very meticulously designed with the cus- consumer journey in mind. I can see that you have a 10-minute video as, I would say, a lead magnet that takes, that start the conversation, start that journey where people sign up, give you, give you their email so that you can start a conversation with them, and two, in order to um, get the courses Uh, So tell me more about this business journey. Well, so I have been a designer now. It's been about 16 years. So after I finished my doctorate, I had every plan of maybe continue to teach at a university level and maybe becoming dean of a college. That's why I have a PhD. They were, they were kind of getting a group of us together, wanting us to move up the ranks in the, in the college and university setting. But I had two really small children at the time, a brand new baby. Um, every like, ev- my family always laughs because I'd do a degree and I'd have a baby like ten days later, kind of thing. So guess what? Here, here's a trick. If anyone wants to do a PhD, just be pregnant. They will not say no to you in committee because you're probably having contractions, which I was <laughs> in my committee meetings. So I'd have a baby, and I just decided it was time to start a design business, and. I I actually started in the weirdest little niche market called digital scrapbooking and uh, started creating these online designs, ended up building a, a, a really successful six-figure, multiple six-figure design business. And um, about three years ago, I had been hounded by designers everywhere asking, how are you doing this? Because the average, especially designer who's doing it by themselves, they're only making maybe 50 to 80,000. I've heard 90,000. Most are not expected to make multiple six figures. This is really, really hard. 
And I realized that I just had some knowledge about running a business. Um, and with my academic background in, in design, um, I started a program. And uh, it has taken off in a way I had no idea. It went from little me to 14 people on a team, uh, hundreds of people in this program, and uh, just teaching people how to make money as designers. And we do teach design as well because I'm kind of a little crazy about great design. And I think in an AI world, we have to be crazy about good design because if anyone can put in, and I agree with you, I actually think it's great that especially early entrepreneurs can get their own logo and they don't have to pay a designer. They can just go through AI. That's actually helpful, ironically, to the design community because most designers don't want a small job of just a logo, right? They're usually doing full branding and they're running bigger campaigns and they're doing huge freelance packaging jobs. So like a single logo is... Um, we'll have a few of those jobs come through Design Suite and we give them to our designers to do. But it's more about experience than it is about money, like teaching them to work with a client, understand how to think like a client. So I actually am very grateful to AI for that because if you can go in as a new entrepreneur, you have no money um, in your back pocket and you're just like, I'm just trying to get this to go. If I can go to Firefly, Mid Journey, or any other AI that's going to generate something for me, and it's pretty good because you don't really know what you want at that stage. That takes a lot of pressure off of a designer who doesn't want to create that kind of product. I'm um, first of all, I'm impressed by the journey, and I want to know more about how did you make money initially with with your earlier business. Well, this is going to get really interesting because I was the creative director of a scrapbooking company. Scrapbooking is a niche uh, market, usually catered to women between the ages of 25 to 65. And what they do is they buy papers, like 12 inch by 12 inch papers, and they stack it and layer and put all their memory stuff on it. So photographs and uh, memorabilia and all of that. So that became a craze in the early 2000s. Like scrapbooking everywhere. Like women were scrapbooking because they were putting them into these albums and they had these beautiful memories for themselves. So when I kind of came upon the scene, um, it had, there was this like tangent called digital scrapbooking. And so all these women were learning how to use uh, Photoshop elements or Photoshop. This is before we had apps that could make us all kinds of pretty things for us. So they had to learn software and they would create the same thing that they normally would do physically with lots of papers. They would now do it digitally and then they would print it off at their local printer, Costco or, or some other place where they could print it. And they would create albums. Well, back then we didn't have like, you know, now there are all these cool things where that'll build albums and stuff for you. So it was huge. It, I mean, in this tiny little market, it was super huge. And so I learned about it and I was like, you know what, I'm going to start making product for that. So what that is, is 12 inch by 12 inch papers. So a lot of papers, like with patterns, colors, distressing, and then elements. So like tags, uh, ribbons, all those things that would go with it that people could digitally stack. So that's what I got into. And it was the early age of digital downloads. People weren't doing digital downloads before this. This is like the first time like where regular consumers were like, this is like, I mean, yes, there was Amazon, but no one was not, no one was really buying from Amazon, right? Like books, maybe. It was like people were getting on and learning software so they could build things digitally. So that's how I kind of fell into the digital world of selling and designing online. And uh, when Amazon came about, did you uh, stop doing it altogether? Or did you try to ride the Am Amazon wave? Or like, what, what happened then? Amazon was actually great for me. I, so I was in physical sewing patterns. I'm also a fabric designer. I'm kind of well known for, uh, I designed for Riley Blake and I come out with a collection usually every single year. So I was still in the physical space as well. 
But Amazon was great for us in early days because they were trying to be, as we now know, but back then we didn't know, they were trying to be like Walmart, you know, like you could put anything in there before it was just books. And so early on, we put in um, sewing patterns. So we had physical products in there, but digital scrapbooking really didn't compete with Amazon. Amazon wasn't doing digital products. Digital products were still only being produced by these tiny little websites like my own or some of the uh, online spaces that I was working in. And so because of that, Amazon really didn't touch it. If anything, Amazon improved all of these online spaces, improved all these other markets we were in as designers because people got used to buying online. And that's what we needed. And that's what we even saw during COVID. And part of the reason I started a program before before everyone was used to Zoom, right, and getting online, it was scary to join a program that was online. Now people find it acceptable. They're willing to get on Zoom and learn from someone directly online. I thought I would never teach except for in a university platform. Like I, I taught a little bit online, but just it wasn't very big. So when I switched over and ch chose to build like a university type platform, um, people were willing to say yes to it. So it's there is this interesting thing as we kind of develop that as regular consumers, and that's what you're after. We're not talking about business people, people who are into technology, because those people are already innovators, right? We're, we're kind of already on things. It's the normal everyday user. We need them to want to be online to do things. And that's what we saw in the early 2000s, like this kind of like shift going up where pe like normal people were like, wait, I can learn software. Wait, I can buy these digital products and download them and have them on my computer. And it really changed the face of everything. It's amazing how I can see pattern in your mindset that you're always trying to see um, how, what doors it opens instead of seeing what door it closes. And I think the same thread of communication that goes on your YouTube channel as well when you talk about design jobs, you're saying, okay, this is a wave, let's embrace it. Let's see how it's going to help us as designers and, and how it's going to make our life easier. So you're not worried at all about jobs when it comes to design? No. In fact, actually, there. I think it's the perception of what designers do. What we see in the forefront that designers do is they create the thing, right? The logo, the brochure, the advertisement. We think that is the thing that designers do. But the truth is designers do two other things that are very important in the process that AI cannot do right now. I hope one day they can do because that would actually make my life a lot easier. One of them is production. And so the format that we get a design in, however we design it, that then has to go to a production period. And depending on where it goes, so for example, as the creative director of a scrapbooking company, so everything had to be sent to print directly from the designer. And we would have to go through a production process, adding SKUs, understanding which SKUs was going, naming the papers. Oh my gosh, I would love it if AI would name all of my papers for me, something cute. Um, making sure that it's all set up with bleeds, making sure it's either CMYK or RGB, whichever one is correct, and getting it all set up so that when it goes to the printer, it's correct. Um, this is actually a prop, like uh, an issue that we have as designers. We'll accidentally send the printer something in production that is actually totally wrong. So I am really excited for AI to get to that place where it can like actually help us with production because it's the bane of a designer's existence. And it's like one of the main things that AI is not doing for us right now. You know, it's creating things, but like then we're stuck with all the production work. One of the things we teach right now is called, uh, we teach people how to design something called an SVG file. Now this file is created in Adobe Illustrator. Usually it's a, um, it's a file, it's called a scalable, uh, SVG, scalable vector graphic. I had to think that one through. So that SVG file makes and cuts for crafters on um, a few different machines, in particular, the Cricut machine and the Silhouette machine. These are used by people consumers everywhere. There's so, I mean, millions of these machines out there and people cut birthday cards off of them and tags off of them and all these things for their homes and for decor and all of that good stuff. So one of the things we designed are these SVG files. If you go and take from 
Firefly Mid Journey or any of these other graphics, you take a, pic a pixel based file from them. You literally spend hours in production getting it ready to work for one of these machines. And this is one little machine. We're not talking about all the other, th making sure things are website ready, make sh making sure things are zipped ready, making sure the TOUs, like the terms of use in your products are correct. There are all these pieces involved that AI just simply isn't doing yet. I do think it's going to get there, but it makes it so you think, oh, design is just the design piece when there's actually all of these other pieces that designers are the ones taking care of. I know a lot. A big part of your job is ideation, coming up with a concept. I'm coming from the advertising industry. We, we focus a lot on the concept. Do you see value in, in, in generating uh, with these generative models um, ideas? Do you, do you feel that they are as creative as us or can be? Oh, that is an interesting question that I have not thought about. But uh, we talked a little bit before this on my YouTube channel. We've been doing this AI versus Karina challenge. And my friend Asia has, uh, she's one of our coaches in our program, has done it with us. One of us will run AI. The other one will do the challenge. And I will say that one of the things I love about AI, especially for designers, is that it does generate ideas that you would not have thought of. You know, when I was doing the mushroom challenge, Asia had three minutes to draw it, and I had three minutes to pull one up on AI to try to find one that I liked. I didn't find one that specifically worked for the, what we were trying to do, but it came up with ideas that I would not have had. I, I just wouldn't have generated. So I think there's some good and bad things there. I think there's some good things because when I see all that beautiful artwork, I'm like, oh, and it kind of clicks in my head. Oh, like what if we take this mushroom and we move it this way and we change some of the things about it here and then we move it into the final design and I think it'll work really nicely. So I do think that that mix of human plus AI is a really beautiful thing. The thing I'm not sure about, and, and we'll just have to see how this progresses as we move forward, is if humans start to rely too much on AI for their design work, how much of it are they going to take and, you know, kind of like mesh up with our own designs to make sure that it's staying pretty unique? Because if AI keeps generating the same stuff for all 2 million designers out there or whatever, then your logo is going to look the same, just a little bit off than your competitor's logo, right? And so I do think we have to be thoughtful about that. And we'll just have to see what happens as AI continues to evolve. Speaking of your experiments, I'm, uh, I browse social media and I see a lot of images uh, on social media. Would be really cool to, to run an experiment to see if humans could detect whether this image is AI generated or a human design. Give me 10 images and I have to vote AI or not. Maybe you should do it with me. That would be a hilarious Let's challenge. Let's do it. I'm because down. you never, we, <laughs> we should do it. We should see if, um, especially age might make a difference as well, right? Because I think that, so this is why this is, this is where I get a little bit nerdy. My doctorate, we did a ton of research on short-term memory and on the difference between typography, illustration, photograph. And this would be the same thing, right? You'd run, like you'd let people see 10 images. They'd have to vote which was uh, which was AI generated, which, which was designer drawn. But I... I would want to see if age played a factor in that, like the older you are, I don't know what the high hypothesis would be, but the older you are, could you detect it more or less? And then the younger you are, could you detect it more or less? I'd be very curious about that. And you could do it through the years, right? Because here's the thing, AI really, like, have you seen all the images where, you know, they're still, it's coming out with six fingers and all that interesting stuff, right? Like the, the pictures still kind of look the same. Don't mm -hmm. you think, and just, I think we're only a couple of years away from the AI to getting better. Right now, Definitely. it doesn't know how to make stuff that looks different enough yet. I talk a lot in, in my podcast here about uh, us being hybrids. I think the next evolution and what AI is enabling us is becoming, is making us hybrid humans that it's kind of like humans plus AI or humans powered by AI. And here the threat is that what if AI becomes so good that our, our influence on the, on the decisions are minimalized where the AI's influence is, is, is kind of like there's a, there should be a balance here 
between like how much we rely on this technology. It's like when, when you, uh, when we start having our mobile phones, we stop memorizing phone numbers. We start when we're using Google Maps, we stop recognizing streets. So, do you think that um, this technology is making us better, uh, short and long term? What's your views there? That is a deep question, but I think I think it's a mixed result, right? Because here's the thing. If I don't have to memorize every phone number in my phone, if I don't have to memorize every street, it leaves a lot of brain power to do other things, does it not? It does. Yeah. I mean, so so I think if you have brain power for other things that an AI is taking care of, you know, it's like I always say in business, like I don't give away the things that are strategic and creative in my business because I'm the one trying to come up and make those ideas happen. Whereas I will give away administration and anything that seems really easy and task oriented as quick as I can. I think it's the same thing with AI. And that's why I, I like that's why I'm not worried about design and AI, because in some some ways, some of the uh, even creation, early creation period and logo design and other th things like that, it's actually, it bogs you down as a designer. You want to be kind of at the top end of things, cleaning up the design, making sure that the thought process and the strategic process in that logo is being used correctly. You almost would rather be a consultant to make sure the design is going to work the way it needs to work, right? And so it is a deep question. I I just don't know where it's going to go, but as you can tell, I'm an optimist about these things. I feel like throughout history, there have been things that have disrupted the way we have done things, right? AI is one of those things right now. But um, I, I always use this exa example with my designers because, you know, they get nervous about it. And I'm like, uh, Char have you seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the new one? Not the newest um, one, like the Willy Wonka one. No, I have not. No. Okay. No. So the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, there's a scene in it where, uh, I can't remember, Mr. Buckets, Charlie's dad, loses his job. He works in a toothpaste factory and he's, sc he's screwing on a lid to a toothpaste. And that was his job. He just screwed lids on toothpaste uh, tubes. Okay. That was his main job. And he lost his job because a machine came in and could do it for him and for cheaper, right? So they bought the machine and they could screw on lids so they didn't need people anymore, okay? It's the same disruption. Suddenly we don't need people to do X, Y, and Z. However, at the end of the film, Mr. Buckets gets a job fixing the machine that screws on the lids of the toothpaste. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing here with AI. I actually think it's going to replace things that we do not need anymore, or that can be easily automated. So the initial idea for a design, even in some ways like that, a designer doesn't have to do that. Like a, a, a consumer can kind of go in, figure out what they want that initial design to be. But then you have to, at the tail end, get a designer to come in and produce it correctly, add anything, mix things up. I mean, you've got to do all these things to get it ready to go so that you can actually use it, right? And so I, I think this is the same, not just with design, but like almost every field. You want to have the job fixing the machine, not the job that just does like the boring stuff at the beginning. But that's the optimist view. And I really like to hear the optimist view. And I enjoy hearing you talk. <laughs> but right now you're saying, well, yeah, we don't need to memorize phone numbers. We need, we need our brain powers to do bigger things. But what happened when AI could do the bigger things? So it's kind of the, the it's like we're losing more and more things that AI could do better than us. Um, and then you feel that you're, you're, we're losing a little bit every day as this technology gets better, we're losing more of our sense of worth as a human being. And this is also raises some philosophical questions on our self-worth and what's the purpose of life and, you know, all of that bigger questions. As soon as you started talking, I was like, what you're really questioning here is purpose of life, don't you think? Like, because if AI can do everything for us, then, um, then there is a question of like, building and creating purpose, right? And I still think we still have that. We just have to figure it out because one of the things I I have three kids, 
and I talk to my kids about often is that if everything is taken away, what do we have left? Relationships, right? And so I think that there's still purpose to be found. And if anything, I think there's got to be a middle ground because I think if AI can take away some of the work, I right now work a long like a lot of hours, right? And if AI can take away some of those hours from me and those hours could be spent with my family, with people I love, with friends I adore, if it can help me um, fly and get to the places I want to go much faster to be with the people I want to be, I actually think AI, and once again, this is the optimist in me, I think AI has the ability to do the thing we actually want to do the most as humans, which is connect with other humans, But I could be wrong about this. We'll just have to see how it turns out. I also think it becomes sort of point of view and how we use the AI. I hear all the time designers moaning and groaning about AI. But every time I dig into it, it just, it doesn't seem like a mega threat right now. Maybe it will be at some point. But my thought is, if you're a designer and you love designing, you will figure out a way to work with AI AI and kind of get your ideas out there in a different way. So I just think it'd be really hard to see humans not still innovating and creating. All what you're saying is is perfect if you're making a living. If you have a paycheck coming to your door, that's totally fine. It will free me some, some time to connect with loved ones and build and enhance relationships, and I'm on for it. But if I am desperate, if I'm under pressure, to make money. And I know that you help your students make money as they learn how to design. And I want to know how you, you you do that. But let's say, you know, you're under all of that stress. And now here it is, AI comes. And then companies who generally hire designers, they can get away with, instead of hiring 20 designers, they would get away with hiring five. And now you've got 15 designers struggling to find a job and struggling to put food on the table. I have multiple questions. Like, first of all, do you agree with uh, universal basic in- income as this AI becomes very mature and strong? And I don't know if you've heard of universal basic income. Basically, it's um, OpenAI is proposing a solution that all of these AI companies, they have to give back large amount of money back to the society. A lot of uh, the services basically become free. Borderline socialism uh, system. And that, if that's the case, then I don't have to worry about making a living, then welcome AI, you know, make my life better by all means. And the second question is about hmm. how you help your students make money. Yeah, I'll, I'll dig into both of those. The first one, I have not heard of this before. I think it's a very interesting concept. Here's my only issue with it. I know that I work harder when I get a reward at the end. And there's still things that we need done in society. In fact, one of the issues we're seeing right now is, you know, the next generation, the Gen Z generation coming up, and I have Gen Zers, uh, not wanting to take jobs that are traditional. Think about plumbing, electricity, like some of these jobs, instead they all want to be YouTube stars or they want white collar type jobs, right? And so my biggest concern about some kind of universal plan is we all have to do things to get a reward. And I still want to see a system in place. And right now, capitalism does that to some degree, right? Because if you work really hard, supposedly you will make money from it, right? It sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, right? So it's not that I don't uh, agree with a universal system, but I just think there needs to be a checks and balance system with it. And I think there's something in between that would be good for everybody. So, um, I do, you know, when I think about AI, I think about like, can they help us with um, food technology, farming technology, all these things that will make it better for everybody so that we can raise, raise everyone past that poverty line so that everybody has a good living. But I think it's going to be still really difficult to get everybody from, you know, if we can get everyone to middle class, that would be amazing. But the wealthy of the wealthiest, right? Because there is still things in place where, you know, they have figured out ways or they've already inherited it, right? Depending on how you look at it to make money. It's, I think it's a really complex system. So I think kind of a 
like across the board, universal is probably not going to work. But, you know, I could be wrong about that. Um, the second question you have is how do I teach my designers to make money? So traditional methods out there where people teach to make money is usually licensing agreements, freelance jobs, they're teaching designers to get clients. We don't do any of that. So we use exactly the methods I use to get my first job in digital scrapbooking. Um, my first couple of jobs in digital scrapbooking, we use those exact same methods I did 16 years ago with our designers today. And that is they build online businesses for themselves in niche fields where people build digital downloadable products. And the cool thing is we're in a society now where people accept digital downloadable loadable products. There are a lot of products out there that need digital downloadable products. Like I talked about the Cricut and Silhouette machines. Those have to have downloadable products in order for people to use them. So they'll go buy a physical machine, but then they have to buy designs off the internet in order to, to do it. So we put together a, like a so our program's a year long. We teach design along with teaching business. So it's like an MBA and four year design degree in one. It's cuckoo. Um, it's, I'm going to say it's a little intense. The first six weeks are especially intense because we have you open your first shop within the first six weeks, even if you don't really know how to design yet. We still open it up. We still get you going. We still teach you how to make previews, how to market yourself. Okay. But usually I would say the average designer in our program gets their first sale within 12 weeks. So that we, we just start getting sales and we're in a high volume, low price product. So a lot of SVG files, for example, are only 99 cents, printables, stickers, 99 cent downloads, right? So you need high volume of those in order to make a lot of money. And I can just tell you, like, there were months where I'd make between 10,000 to $20,000 so off just digital designs. So what we're talking about on 99 cent products, and then usually I paid a commission to whatever platform I was on on top of that. So we're talking about making at some points, like I was making two cents to 20 cents per item and making between 10 and $20,000. So like this is a high range market and people just didn't realize it because we're so niche that you had to own a machine or you had to be in decor to be really into it, right? So now, especially with print on demand products, designers can design in a lot of different fields, not just SVG files, printables, clip art, right? Clip art is something that business owners are always looking for to add to their websites and all of that. Um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, fonts, we teach fonts, dingbat design. Um, so there are a lot of these little niche markets that people are using in a lot of different ways that you can design for if you can create a volume of product really well designed to make money. So we, we always tell our designers, it still takes three years, right? Any good business really takes three years to build up. And we tell them the same thing, but you spend the first year with us to make sure that you're on track so that you're ready to rock and roll. That's brilliant. Such a great idea, honestly. And um, for those listening, go to designsuitecourses.com and I'll leave the links uh, to this in the description. Uh, fabulous job. Uh, my last question is about your content creation journey. I enjoyed your channel because you're very authentic, very natural. At the same time, you teach in, in, a, in your, your own unique way. So tell me, how, how's your journey going? I know content creation is a long journey and very lonely as well, because I'm in it too. And, you know, sometimes you feel that you're speaking to yourself for the most part. But how, how, how are you doing content-wise? And what's your plan? Content's, what's your strategy? Content's a very interesting thing because I see all of these, especially entrepreneurs, and I know you're creating a ton of content as well. I create a lot of content, but I still think of myself as a designer and trying to create design content. Um, I do very much enjoy, we just talked about, you know, these challenges I did with Asia. I do interviews on there. I will watercolor and teach watercolor while I'm talking. I'll draw on my iPad and teach design while I'm talking. Um, but I try to make it joyful because here's the thing. I think Anyone can choose to do anything with this life, right? They can go be a banker. They can go be, my husband's an attorney. You can go be a doctor. You could like, you could be an administrative person. All right. So if you choose to be a designer, 
it's because it's not really all about the money. Yeah, we want to make money, but it's really because you're creative. You want to create and you want to make. And that's the thing that feels fulfilling to you. And so if you come to me, the reason it's so joyful and because I want to teach you so much and, and give you that kind of education is because you want to be on a path that I have been on. And I remember early days when I finished my doctorate, I was just designing full time, I was designing fabric, I was designing pa scrapbooking paper. Um, I was really loving my life. I had little kids, but I was really loving my life. And I remember pinching myself, literally pinching myself on my thigh as I was driving, saying, Karina, you have the most awesome life. You are so lucky. Part of it is because I can see very clearly how lucky I have been. I came from nothing. Uh, my mom's Chinese. My dad is white. I grew up not poor. We were very poor when I was first born, like kind of like outhouse poor, like my parents had, like I was born and there was a house, they bathed in the river kind of thing. Like it was crazy. But by the time I was like, in middle school, we lived in a regular, I would say middle class neighborhood, but we certainly didn't have money. There was a lot of stress about money. And um, the fact that I came from that first, first generation immigrant and was able to get not only a doctorate, but create a multiple six business, uh, six uh, figure business as a designer, now a multi million dollar business as a design uh, coaching program, right? Like a program, it, it kind of blows my own mind. And I think that a lot of times people just aren't grateful for what they already have. Yeah, I've done a lot, but I would have been happy even at the multiple six level, like just being a designer, like, cause that was more than anyone ever expected of me. I think, you know, it's definitely more than I ever expected of myself getting the doctorate more than I ever expected of myself. It kind of just happened because I was on that journey. And so I think you know, as we play with this idea of AI and our humanity, I think that it all comes down to being op like opt realistically optimistic. There are going to be things that are going to be struggles along the way, but I can only control what's happening in my life and try to voice and bring happiness to other people. And you're going to see that in my content. That's a, um, such a wonderful way to end. Uh, our recording. Uh, Karina, thank you so much for taking time to speak to me. I'm so grateful that I got to be here and uh, look forward to uh, maybe the two of us getting together and doing some fun AI research. I'd love that. Thank you so much.